Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'll get us started. Um, welcome. We are here this morning for the Infrastructure and Environment Subcommittee of the African American Task Force. I am uh, one of your co chairs, Senator T.B. Lachman, and I'm here uh, with Senator Marie Pinckney to uh, lead us through our meeting. I feel like we haven't seen each other in a minute, but we um, are going to be focusing this month on. Um, I'll say wrapping up, but uh, sort of having the, a, a large portion, uh, the most significant portion of our housing conversation, which we had already begun and set some, some broad priorities. And we wanted to take this opportunity to bring in some, some stakeholders, folks who are very engaged with this, this work to talk us through some of their experiences um, and help us consider some more specific uh, priorities moving forward that we can um, approve as a subcommittee and send to the full body um, of the task force uh, before moving on to, um, I think, our, our, our longer term focus based on the amount of, of uh, space it took up in our, our earlier priorities um, to move on to the environmental piece. So, so today we're really going to be focused on the housing conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, Senator Pinkney, do you have anything you wanted to add? Good morning. Thank you, Senator Lachman. Hello, everyone. Um, I am very excited for this conversation to be talking about housing. It's such a complex and multifaceted topic from homelessness to housing affordability to location of housing. Um, and we have some really amazing speakers that are going to give us varying insights um, and help us come to some conclusions and some uh, further ideas of what we can do as legislators and what our subcommittee can be focused on. Um, so I'm very excited to have you, uh, you all here to educate and inform us and, and help further the conversations that we've been having. So thank you all. Great. All right, so let's see, next slide. I think we are gonna be uh, seeing who's here, uh, Senator Pinkney and I are very much here. Um, so I guess we will, um, Caitlin, would you like to call the roll? Sure. Um, Harold Stafford. Willie Scott. Present. Dan Young. Dana Cobb. Present. Marlena Gibson. Present. Marlene Saunders. Okay. Abby Samuels. Present. Simone Philpotts. Wendy Henry. Representative Larry Lambert. Present. Madam Chairs, we do have a quorum. Okay, great. All right. Um, so having a quorum, um, hopefully you guys got a chance to check out the meeting minutes from March. Um, so we would just be looking for a motion to approve those minutes from one of our subcommittee members. So moved. And I, pardon me, um, Dan Young just joined us. So oh, welcome, sure. Dan. Welcome, Dan. I heard a motion from uh, uh, So moved, Willie Scott. Okay, and do we have a second? Second. Great, and that was Dr. Saunders. Um, any objections to approving those minutes? All right, I think we are all good there. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I think we are just going to get right in um, to the presentations and the guests that we asked to join us. So we're gonna give them each a little time to speak to their work um, and, and some of their ideas and priorities and, and we'll give um, members of the subcommittee an opportunity to, to ask any questions uh, as we go. Um, so with no further ado, um, we're going to start on the topic of, of homelessness. And we've asked uh, Carrie Casey from Newcastle County, who is a bit of a legend uh, in this area to, <laughs> you know, you are Carrie. She's very no. humble. No, thank you. <laughs> uh, to speak a little bit to her work um, and, and give us some thoughts on, on where we can go from here. So great. Here, I'll get over to you. Thank you, Senator Lockman. And it, would it be possible to share my screen? Is that, is that a pop? I have some slides. If that, yes. I don't know. Okay, great. Okay. Let me just do that really quickly. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. 
to first slide and slideshow. Okay. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, so good morning. Uh, um, my name is Carrie Casey. I work for the Division of Community Development and Housing for Newcastle County. Um, I'm kind of here with two hats and I'm going to try to get through as much information as I possibly can. Um, I'm, I'm here on behalf of Newcastle County, but I also am so honored to be the chair of the Delaware Continuum of Care, which is a group that is statewide that is a community based grassroots group um, that works to end homelessness in the state. Uh, Marlena Gibson, my colleague that's on the um, on this task uh, subcommittee is also on the board of the Delaware COC. So I'm, I'm here. I'm going to try to fit in as much as I can in 10 minutes. Um, so if I if it seems that it's it's like just you know a lot of information at one time, I apologize. But I, I want to get in um, a, a lot of information about what 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 homelessness looked like in the state before COVID, and then I'd really like to to focus on on the jurisdictions, the state, the counties, the cities, um, sort of uh, re how how we managed. Um, COVID with people experiencing homelessness and something that I'm exceptionally proud of is the state and all the jurisdictions working together um, to help this vulnerable population. Um, so, so I, but I do want to thank the chairs, Senator Lockman and Senator Pinckney for having me as well as all of the task force members of the African American Task Force um, and Infrastructure Environmental um, Subcommittee. I'm very honored to be here. So, this is, uh, we're required by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development to, to take a survey uh, census of what homelessness looks like on one night in January, okay? So January, 2020, this is before the pandemic hit us. Uh, we were out in droves um, counting and surveying our homeless populations through the state. So this is a pre-COVID, we don't have our 2021 numbers yet and it'll be really interesting to see, to see what, what happens there. So on any given night in Delaware, um, there are about 1,165 people experiencing homelessness. Uh, roughly 60%, which you know equates to um, the population, are from Newcastle County. And then 25% uh, or so really varies by year in Kent County and about 18% in Sussex County. It's sometimes difficult to get an adequate count in some of the rural counties because those folks aren't, there aren't a lot of shelters um, and people are harder to find because they're living really in unsheltered situations. So on any given night, we're looking at about 1,165, 1,100 people experiencing homelessness in our state, which doesn't seem like a huge number, but, but you know, it's definitely still a number that we want to work on. Um, and looking at gender, and this is a lot of information, about 60% of, of those experiencing homelessness from that number were male, 40% female, 58% uh, 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 were Black, African American, 35% white, 6% other races, 1% other. The ages, um, you know, again, Sometimes hard to quantify some of these younger ages, but 25 and older were about 71% of the of the of that 1165. 18 to 24 year olds, 6%, and then under 18, 23%. And I say that age 18 to 24 is hard to quantify because a lot of that age group doesn't necessarily enter shelter. They do a lot of couch surfing, sleeping in cars. It's, it's really, uh, HUD is always trying to focus on youth homelessness, but it's, it's a challenge to try to count those folks. When look, looking at ethnicity, 9% of those experiencing homelessness from that 1165 number um, were, were Latino. So um, again, this is all point in time data. We submit this to HUD uh, from 2020. So uh, about 714 looking at households, about 80, close to 80% were adults only. Uh, and then about 21% were households with children. And then we, we, there was one counted as a child only household back um, when we did the count. So, and, and, and this is really important. And I think, you know, a lot to look at with people experiencing homelessness and some of the challenges that they face. Nobody wants to be homeless. You know, I think that's, that's the key. Um, but if you look at what, what people have had to go through, 
and what types of conditions and what kind of um, health conditions they have, it shows a lot. A, 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 the largest number of folks, 267, would, 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 would designate themselves as chronically homeless. And this is the most challenging population, but, but as a state, we've made inroads in helping that population specifically around homeless veterans. So that chronically homeless are people who indicated that they've been homeless for at least a year or repeatedly over a few years. And they were also struggling with a disabling mental health or physical condition. Uh, 117 had indicated they had mental illness or mental health condition, 70 uh, substance abuse disorder, 10 HIV AIDS positive, and 41 survivors of domestic abuse. Looking at, so, so, so that gives you kind of a snapshot of what that population looked like in, uh, before COVID. Um, and you look at our housing inventory. What do we have to, to help those experiencing homelessness? At that time, um, 644 emergency shelter beds located throughout the state, though a lot of them are in Newcastle County. Permanent supportive housing, which is this wonderful, precious resource where uh, folks are given a permanent place to stay and live and also wrap around case management for as long as they need it. We are lucky to have 670 beds. Rapid rehousing is where a person is put into permanent housing and then provided all the wraparound resources for about uh, up to a year, including rental subsidy and other um, funding case management. So you kind of put the person in a permanent housing and then you provide all the services to them. So they're not staying in, in a shelter. There are 382 units of transitional housing and then other permanent housing at 19 beds. This includes 71 domestic violence beds and 27 HIV beds. So, this is, this is something you know, that, that we at the COC are always striving. The average number of days spent homeless for all households in Delaware is, is 102 days. That, that's something we'd like to lower. Uh, I, I think best practice, I mean, a dream would be 60 days, um, you know, even between 30 and 60 days. It's just very challenging because we have a lack of affordable housing, which I know we're gonna talk about later. The average number of days spent homeless for Black, non-Hispanic, non-Latino households was 107 days. Uh, the average number of days spent homeless for White, non-Hispanic, non-Latino households is 98 days. So we're seeing Black households experience homelessness a week longer than the average for all households, while White households experience homelessness for four, day, four less days on average. So this, this is some of the data that the COC has really started to focus on. Um, is some of the disparate impacts of homelessness on Black and Latino households. So he, he, another, this is, this is, you know, really stark, I mean, and, and something that, that has driven the COC to action. Um, and this is a national, this isn't just in Delaware. Black individuals are five times more likely to experience homelessness than white individuals. And Black families are eight times more likely to experience homelessness than families with a white head of household. Black families with children make up only 22% of all families in Delaware, but 66% of families experiencing homelessness on any given night. It's really stark and something that as a state, we really need to do better. So homelessness to us, to us at the Delaware COC is a racial justice issue. Uh, the COC has over 120 members. Um, this is something that we've really started um, to focus a lot of our attention on. Um, as stated, you know, we're, we're seeing that over 58% of the homeless population in Delaware is Black, but only 23.2% of the state population is Black. That's five times. So the Delaware Continuum of Care, which I am honored to be the chair of, we, we, we're working to, to achieve housing for all, right? So one of the things that we as a COC, um, we formed the Racial Justice and Equity Committee as part of the COC and as um, meeting to analyze the negative impacts of homelessness on people and communities of color, identify racial disparities, and then propose action steps. So we're working on that and we would love to bring those proposed action steps back to this subcommittee um, when, they're, when they're complete. But it is a very big focus of the Delaware COC um, as to how can we not just analyze the data, but take steps to make it more equitable for all populations experiencing homelessness in our state. So, you know, just to summarize, homelessness before COVID-19, 1,100 people experiencing homelessness, 
A lot of folks are, when you are experiencing homelessness, you are required to call or text daily for shelter until it is made available. Many shelters have limited hours, even if, and in Sussex County, there really aren't many shelters for people to go to. Um, they are open from five to six and individuals must take their belongings and leave by six. Before COVID, daytime access was limited to day centers and libraries. And in the winter, Newcastle County Code Purple only opened when it was below 20 degrees. Kent and Sussex, God love them, opened seasonally from December 1 to March 1st and offer shelter every night um, during the winter. But even with all of this, many individuals in our state remained unsheltered, sleeping outside in cars and risking death, death and sickness. Um, this happened in February of 2020, so right before COVID hit. Um, in Newcastle County, four um, individuals were found deceased in a tent behind the Walgreens on Route 7 solely because they were trying to keep warm. Um, and that really, you know, as, as a homeless advocate, this really hit us hard. This is not the way it should be for trying to stay warm in the winter but have no place to go. So then, so then, so now we're morphing into to what's been happening over the last year. Um, the state shutdown in March of last year was really a, created a breaking point for people experiencing homelessness in our state. Emergency shelters, because a lot had big, you know, congregate areas, really balanced closing doors versus sheltering. The libraries, coffee shops, day centers, all were, were closed. Um, jurisdictions throughout the state, Sussex, Kent, Newcastle County, the city of Wilmington, we all funded sanitation stations to provide hand washing and bathrooms. So that's where we went. That's how desperate this was for people experiencing homelessness is the only way initially we thought we could help was by putting a porta potty and a hand washing station in a location so someone could go to the bathroom and wash their hands. I mean, that, that to me was just so stark that that's where we had to go. Um, and the governor and, and to his credit and, and you know, I think of as again as a best practice nationally created homeless outreach teams which we knew we, th these groups were congregating in front of shelters where they used to be able to enter. Um, these homeless outreach teams were nurses, um, uh, you know, social workers, the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health that went to assess folks. And at, during that March and April, over 2,500 people were assessed for vulnerability. And many of those individuals were placed in motels. And that is where we have found the safest, most effective way to keep people experiencing homelessness during COVID safe is through providing them a motel voucher. Um, and, and, and that has not only helped them, but it's limited community spread. Um, and, and that's been seen nationally. Another thing that you all as legislators and as task force members should be extremely proud of is a strategic partnership that the jurisdictions banded together in April and May, um, put together an MOU where we all put our funding towards the state, the Division of State Service Centers Motel Voucher Program. So people who are experiencing homelessness didn't have to go to five different motel voucher programs. All they had to do was call the 1833 Find Bed and then be funneled into a motel voucher through the State Service Center. Um, that was something that every jurisdiction, including Dover and Newark, put their money together to help provide safe shelter for those during COVID-19. Um, so this is kind of a look. This is the State Service Center. The, the Division of State Service Center, led by Renee Beeman and her team, uh, mobilized and between January and December of 20. Um, uh, between the, you know, up till December, placed over 1,658 households in hotels and motels throughout the state. Um, largest number was in Sussex, 686. Um, they also, that included adults and children, 3,571. But they didn't just do that. Um, they also worked in partnership with all of the jurisdictions and school districts. They created a learning pod at the Red Roof Inn in Newark. Um, they, you know, they, they provided, we did COVID testing throughout the state um, and, and it was, you know, just really an unbelievable, um, I would say Herkley, Herkley and just a really major effort to keep families and individuals safe during COVID and to house that many people during the pandemic is just, is just extremely, extremely critical in keeping people safe. 
104 of those folks were seniors 62 and older. Um, so just, and 266 of those 1160 uh, of those people were children. So this just tells you a little bit about it. Not only did they house them, they fed them 364,000 meals. Um, so we as jurisdictions, as Newcastle County, were just super, this was just, I think, something that as a state, when we, when we had to respond to COVID, this should really be a bright spot because of the fact we all kind of tore down our silos and worked together to really help those most vulnerable. Um, Delaware State Housing Authority, big part of this, really an impactful, an impactful project. Um, extremely, extremely proud of the state for stepping up to help these folks. So, so, so now we're looking at October. So October, we know winter is coming and code purple, which you know is usually in church basements and other locations, it really couldn't operate the way that it had in the past. We formed a code purple working group and we began to look at what the shelter system was where they were capacity wise. CDC guidance really wanted people spaced. Um, and, and this is October, the, hotel, uh, the, 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 the shelters, a lot required negative COVID tests, as well as um, some required a 14 day quarantine. Um, and if you can see bed availability. So this is now we're in October. We're starting to prepare for winter here. Um, we started to say, we need to do something impactful because all our shelters are pretty much nearing capacity because CDC guidance said, you know, keep people socially distanced, stay at around 50%. Um, and at this point in time, we were already at um, some even in Newcastle County exceeded um, their bed availability. Winter approached, the hotels were near capacity. We knew from centralized intake, the 1833 fine bed, we had about 100 people unable to be placed into shelter. We were nervous about the eviction moratorium. We had, we had seen some HUD uh, guidance recommending just continuing to, to place people in hotels throughout the winter with on-site case management. So, so this is where, you know, I, this is, so I know we're, I'm kind of all over the place, but this is one other thing, you know, that, that I think has, has helped move the needle a bit as well. I know I'm a little biased because I work for Newcastle County, um, but, you know, I think that um, having the dialogue around uh, the most vulnerable in our state and having the coronavirus relief funds um, and seeing that winter was coming um, the county took the bold step in buying the Sheraton in Newcastle, um, specifically to house folks that were experiencing homelessness in the state. And just to give you a really brief um, background of that, um, the county executive formed a committee back in July on how to use the money to assist the most vulnerable in the in the state in the county. Senator Lockman was our chair, so I really you know. Um, bold ideas always come from her, and this one was probably the boldest idea I feel at least I've been involved in. Um, at that point in July, um, Senator, we all said, let's buy a hotel. At the time, there were no hotels available for sale. Uh, so we thought, well, this is a great idea. Let's keep it in our back pocket. And then on September 12th, we saw that the Sheraton was going up for auction. This is why I think some things are just meant to be, um, and that they wanted a quick settlement. And, um, and the county's funds, the coronavirus relief funds were only available to the end of the year. So they had this chunk of money, this Sheraton, which is isolated because you know sometimes people have a lot of nimbyism around people experiencing homelessness. This hotel really was surrounded by marsh. Um, so the county, uh, county council approved uh, the bid, us bidding on the property on October 27th, 13 to zero, so again, you know, really wonderful that we have government leaders willing to take this kind of bold step. And we were the winning bidder on October 28th. Uh, we bought the hotel on December 1st and we renamed and opened it the Hope Center on December 15th. Um, and that um, we brought in 73 pre-registered unsheltered individuals. So people living outside from uh, Wilmington, Newark and Middletown and then we started to take state service center referrals on December 29th. We were, um, the thing with us is that we actually increased the homeless system by the 187 beds. This is, there was no one living in this hotel. So we were really able to expand um, the, the, the capacity. Um, to date, we have 111 rooms occupied. 
um, 234 residents, 103 of those are children. We allow animals. Um, we have five dogs and four cats. This, this guinea pig and bearded dragon actually have moved into their own apartment. So we're celebrating that. Um, that's Scruff. He, he, was, he joined us on December 15th with his owner. Um, we have uh, about 99 of the guests are between 25 to 75, 16 or 18 to 24. Um, we have, uh, you know, again, about 99 children. So you can see the different ages of or 103 children, the ages of the children. So really zero. We have two newborns and we have a bunch of teenagers. Um, so you, you'll see we have a, a big mix of zero to six and then a big, you know, a big mix of all three of those ages. Looking at our population, 58% are African-American, 39% white, which really just equates to what you see generally in the state. Um, that those statistics, um, uh, the folks experiencing homelessness, again, still have to call the homeless system. And then they're referred to a hotel voucher, which may or may not bring them to the Hope Center. And at this point, we don't take walk-ins. We have a plethora of partners. I won't go through them all because I know I'm running out of time. But the key piece is we kept the former Sheraton staff and they run the, sh the hotel like the Sheraton. Now they're just the Hope Center general manager and they do an awesome job. Friendship House, who had never taken federal money before, had stepped up and they provide 24 hour services, all the meals, case management. Um, and then we have a plethora of medical, behavioral health and medical. We turn the presidential suite into a doctor's office. The division, again, a state agency from day one, the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health has been with us since December 15th, providing mental health referrals, counseling, substance abuse disorder counseling to our guests. Um, there's about a staff of 12 that come every day. They took over the, um, the second floor. We provide transportation to the Prices Corner bus hub. We have faithful friends there for animals. So it really takes a village to run the Hope Center. Um, and our motto is don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. Um, we focus on the exit. So welcome to the Hope Center. Let's see, let's get working on your next step. This is Melissa Summers. She was our first move out um, in March. We've had about eight move outs since then. We had a woman leave yesterday to a house with her three children. Just such an exciting time, you know, kind of teary eyed about that because people have been going through so much um, and to see people be able to move into their own apartment is just, it's just, it's just the best thing ever. So that is, that is me. I, I do want to put my two hats on. You know, we'd love for you all to join the Delaware COC. Um, we have quarterly meetings. We actually have our next one is tomorrow. We do that on Zoom, lots of information. Um, and then also, if you're ever in the area and would like to come and take a tour of the Hope Center, I would be honored to give any of you a, a tour. We can do it with masks and socially distant. Uh, Senator Pinckney and Senator Lockman have been there. Marlena has been there. Um, I love to give tours. It's really awesome to see um, how this beautiful building is really serving the most vulnerable in the county and the state. So thank you. Thank you. Here, I'll lead the applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, Carrie. Uh, it, was, it, it is a lot of information. Um, it's really stark statistics, particularly when we're talking about Black Delawareans. Um, just a really hopeful example of, of bold action and transitioning um, folks to housing and, and the things that, that can be done. Um, I'm just going to give us a couple of quick minutes. Let's, let's say like three minutes if there's any really pressing questions any members of the subcommittee have um, before we move to the next presentation because I do want to be mindful of time. But so if you have a question that you really um, want to ask uh, for members of the, the subcommittee only we'll have to reserve um, to public comment time for, for members of the public. Um, and uh, otherwise I would ask that you write them down, record them. We have uh, Carrie's contact information and can follow up with questions that way. So I'll look to see if any members of the subcommittee um, have a question. Um, and if not, we will move on to Cheyenne Miller and we can just hold, oh, yes, Willie. Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, yeah. You indicated that to gain access to uh, one of the shelters, not necessarily the hotel, but some of the other shelters that uh, individuals would have to call a text daily uh, to check availability. Uh, does that work, uh, you know, given that, you know, perhaps some people may not have access to a cell phone and all of that good stuff? 
Yes, sir. That that's a really good question. Um, it, it is difficult for folks. Um, we do, they also can go to a state service center um, as well um, to access that information. So, so it's call, text, email, uh, obviously, especially with our libraries being closed, it's difficult. Or um, you could go to a state service center, which are located throughout the state um, and, and access that, that system as well. I should have cleared that up. So okay, Thank you. yeah. Gary, would it also be possible for you to share your PowerPoint presentation? You have some really good stats on there of that course. I think members would like to hold on to. Of course, I'd be happy to. Thank you. If you want to send it to, to maybe Caitlin and then yep. we can disperse it back out. Happy to. Thank you. And thank you, Carrie. This is fantastic to kind of focus us on some of the, the, uh, the statistics and the dynamics of, of getting people housed. Um, oh, Dr. Saunders? You're on mute, Dr. Saunders. Oh, I just wanted to say great report. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Dr. Saunders. Yes, thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to Cheyenne Miller from the Homes Campaign uh, to give us a, about 10 minutes on tenants' rights, uh, talk about those issues and, and possibilities in that area. So Cheyenne, are you with us? I am. There you are. I am also going to share my screen, great. if that's okay. So I appreciate um, having the space to come and talk to the subcommittee about housing. I know that this is more of a focus on tenants' rights, and so I'll try to focus what our policy um, agenda is on tenants' rights with just a little bit of information about who the Homes Campaign is. Um, essentially, we believe that housing is a human right, and we focus on not only tenants, but also on ensuring that there is affordability, um, in, in, in for renters, making sure that there are high quality rentership opportunities, ensuring that there's fair opportunities for home ownership. That means, you know, no discrimination and ensuring that people who already own a home should be able to actually keep their home. We wanna end homelessness and we also want to ensure that there are accessible housing options for people who are returning from prison. So we are a um, issue campaign that comes under the Building People Power campaign and Building People Power is um, an initiative of the Metropolitan Women's and Urban League. And we are essentially a volunteer group, people who are um, unhoused, local residents, people who identify as ad educators, advocates, community organizers that you know care about essentially changing this, this system that we have right now that does not realize housing as a human right. And our big thing right now <laughs> um, for most things is about stability, investment, and protection. How do we stabilize neighborhoods? Um, how do we increase you know, the economic outcomes in neighborhoods without displacing people? How are we ensuring that we're not divesting from neighborhoods, but we're actually investing in neighborhoods? We know sometimes that the approaches to improving neighborhoods can take a very, um, a very much like uh, extractive um, approach and what we want to see is more investment from the state from our local areas in neighborhoods and of course protecting the most vulnerable residents that is the most important and that includes people who are returning from prison that includes tenants that includes homeowners and that of course includes people who are experiencing homelessness and just to be clear um, you know our thing is we don't think we're going to do a lot of change through charity um, we think charity matters, but it's not going to be what sustains good change and makes, you know, housing a human right. And so we look at policy advocacy and human, I mean, excuse me, and community organizing as the best way for us to have some sustainable change when it comes to um, housing reform. And we think that everyone should be involved. There shouldn't be um, a limit on who can come. So we want to see collaboration between renters, people who are unhoused, homeowners, landlords, returning residents nonprofit service providers, legislators, everybody in their mama should be working on this. And I won't go into uh, too much of the data because we, we just heard some really great data, but what we are looking at in terms of some real issues that we could have that will improve things, not only for tenants, but people that we don't always think of <laughs> that usually are tenants, like people who are reentering, 
um, and people who would like to become tenants, like people who are experiencing homelessness. So our biggest thing is, um, you know, what are the policies that are going to fix these problems? And we need to improve opportunities for tenants to be protected and for them to get into good housing that's safe for them. And so one of the things that we're looking at is how can we ensure that we get like incentives and in some cases disincentives to ensure that uh, rental properties are getting licensed. And one of them is our recommendation um, to ensure that if you're, going, if you're not going to be licensed and you can't have access to court services. Um, the Wilmington City Council just passed a resolution essentially asking for the Delaware General Assembly to do this to ensure that, you know, let's make sure that we're licensing all of our rental properties, that landlords are licensing their rental properties. The reason that matters is because when a rental property is licensed, it has to go through um, a an inspection and that inspection can help ensure that a tenant is going into a safe and a clean property. And we know that um, poor tenants are much more likely to get into a situation where they're not in a safe and a clean property. Um, and so we wanna ensure that all properties are licensed. The other is that right now, Delaware doesn't actually have a minimum of arrears that are required for eviction. So basically somebody could be evicted from their house for like 50 bucks, <laughs> which is really scary um, to think of. And so we're thinking like, you know, one of the simple things that Delaware can do is require a minimum amount of arrears before a tenant gets evicted. Um, we know that like, if, if we are able to do something small like this, we might be able to save a lot of people from being put out on the street, especially for, like we said, small, small amounts of money. Another is um, ensuring that we're providing more affordable housing for tenants. You know, affordable housing is something that will decrease homelessness and it'll make it so that we're able to have more people who have more stabilized neighborhoods. And so we think that one way that we can do that is all the money that's being put into the downtown development district funds could actually require um, an affordable housing set aside. Currently, um, we don't think there is one and it's, it's not always reliable to rely on developers to do what we may consider to be the right thing. Um, but if we're going to be giving money out as a state, I think most of the money that we give out should require that there's some type of set aside for affordable housing. This is about protecting homeowners. And we think that this um, has a sort of relation in a sense to tenants. Um, tenants can't become homeowners if we have a very leaky system or a system with lots of holes for homeowners to fall through. And so we always include homeowners in our work because we care about ensuring that, you know, this isn't something that we lose. And you'll have to excuse this uh, top bullet. It's the same as the other one, but expanding homeowner repair grant funding. When homeowners have the ability to have um, their homes repaired, it makes it so much easier for them to stay in their homes less likely for them to get um, code violations, which in some cases can lead to foreclosure. And it makes it so that a home is safer for a person to be able to stay in their home. So the state should be, um, again, investing in neighborhoods. And that's one of the ways is to provide uh, homeowner repair grants. The next is um, creating a homestead exemption for code violation foreclosures. So essentially, if someone lives in their home and it's their owner occupied home, they should not have their home foreclosed upon because they have code violations. That is happening right now across the state. Um, people who are living in their home, it's their owned home, it's the only home they have, and they're getting code violation upon code violation, and their municipality um, is going to come and collect on those code violations, and if they can't pay, they're going to foreclose on that home, creating, again, a, a, a situation where someone's going to become homeless. So it just shouldn't be a thing. Um, we should be finding ways to help people fix code violations, not taking their homes away from them because they can't afford to fix them. Um, a Bill of Rights for ex Individuals Experiencing Homelessness. This is something we're fighting on because we know that when a tenant does experience homelessness, unfortunately, when they become mm -hmm. homeless, they struggle um, and right now, the state and many of the municipalities actually take an approach of criminalizing homelessness. And we know that that's just a waste of, of 
our public resources and it's a waste of our, our time. And unfortunately, when we're giving out arrests and tickets and when we're moving um, people away from public spaces, it doesn't actually help people get out of homelessness and, and it makes it actually more likely for them to stay in homelessness. So we're in support of creating a bill of rights that will protect people um, so that they're not being harassed by police, so that they're not being uh, pushed out of public spaces that a, a person who's not in homelessness would have. And then, you know, I think you've all heard um, or uh, have talked at some point to Homes Campaign or Classy or someone about right to counsel. This is a big thing that's happening across uh, the country. Lots of cities are doing it. Um, we think that the state should do this, provide right to counsel for eviction specifically. Um, and we think it should be, you know, free re legal representation, the tenants that are facing eviction. Um, and we know that like, you know, basically we're about to hit a lot of evictions. We have the moratorium that was uh, extended until I believe July, I might be wrong. I think it's July. Um, and you know that that moratorium is not saving people from being evicted. I talk to people every day that are in the process of being evicted today. Um, and we have a lot that we can do to provide some type of support for people who are experiencing evictions. And so a right to counsel is just one. And then of course, um, let's ensure that we are supporting people who are coming home from prison. Um, if we understand housing, um, if we understand one thing about housing when it comes to people who are coming home from prison, it's that like, this is one of the ways that we reduce recidivism. People are less likely to uh, commit a crime when they have a stable house that they can live in. Um, so one thing that's happening right, right, right now is the Delaware State Housing Authority has what they call the Family Reentry Pilot Program. And this program is, is existing, it's happening, and we want to see it become permanent. And so we're hoping that we can get support from the state to ensure that, you know, we're changing the process by which, oops, sorry, by which people who are coming home can have access to public housing in general, just have access to housing in general. There's plenty of other things we can do to ensure that we're not um, recriminalizing people when they come home from prison. And then anybody who wants to get involved, this is sort of our get involved uh, thing. Again, we believe that the whole community has to be there in order to get the work done. And this is it. Cheyenne, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate um, you know the thoroughness and the strength of advocacy from the Homes Campaign and just that you bring so many substantive and like very real recommendations to the table. I, I think it's... Um, it's just really helpful from our perspective as folks who are looking to make, um, you know, specific recommendations around these issues. So again, again, we'll have just a couple of minutes if there's any very pressing questions that individuals on the subcommittee might have um, before we move on to make sure we can hear all of our all of our presentations. So let's see. I see. Don't see any. Thought I saw a hand from the subcommittee. Um, oh, there it goes. Dr. Saunders. Oh, you're on mute. Dr. Saunders, we can't hear you. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Quickly, uh, anyone who is familiar with the housing starts in Sussex County, know, we know that it's, it's just exploding. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's couched as affordable housing. And I wonder if we have like a quotient of that 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 shows the ratio of, of new building starts that are actually affordable mm -hmm. uh because i you know i really wonder uh if 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 affordable housing is used my question is affordable for who great question perhaps um katie millard who will be speaking um towards the end okay uh, she does she's with sussex county habitat habitat for humanity and may have some some good info on that Okay. When we get there, but that's an excellent question. We did want to make sure we covered all the counties today too. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, let's see. And, and Mr. Farrell, I do see you. Just hold your hold your fire until we get get some public comment. I know you're going to have a lot of good stuff for us, and I look forward to hearing it. Um, any other questions from the subcommittee? Okay. We have a lot of bases to cover today. I know. Just going to keep cooking through it. So at this point, a member of our subcommittee, 
um, Marlena Gibson is going to talk to us about home buyer supports, another area that we really wanted to understand how we can understand and, and strengthen what we have here in Delaware. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. There. Folks seeing that okay? That looked great. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so this is um, focusing a little bit more in on home buyer support. So I know we are definitely covering a lot of ground today. It's like an entire housing conference in a packed into two hours, but I think we're doing an excellent job uh, covering um, a huge amount of, of territory here. Um, so just a little intro on DSHA, if folks aren't familiar with us already, we're the state housing finance agency. Um, we also are the state's housing and community development agency. Um, so administer some different federal and state funding that way. Um, and we are also a public housing authority for Kent and Sussex County. So we're one of five PHAs um, in Delaware. And we tend to organize our core services around homeownership, uh, rental housing, and community development. And there is a ton of stuff in each of those, uh, in each of those buckets. Um, you know, we cover pretty much everything in one way or another um, from, and we have some engagement in from kind of homelessness all the way through foreclosure prevention on the, on the housing continuum. Uh, and in introducing this topic, um, Caitlin asked me to cover a little bit about um, about the homeownership gap to start with. So I have a few slides just with some information on that. I shamelessly uh, <laughs> am borrowing these, uh, these charts from the Urban Institute. Um, they're excellent and did not, um, did not think I could improve on them. I would say that folks who are interested in this topic, um, particularly the homeownership gap, the Urban Institute is an excellent, an excellent resource. They have a lot of really great research um, and also kind of suggestions and things on moving forward um, around the homeownership gap. Um, but we know there's a huge wealth gap as well, and homeownership plays a big part in that. There's a significant um, wealth gap between white and non-white households and between white and black households and also for Hispanic households as well. The homeownership rate as a whole um, in, this, in, um, in the nation, there's also a significant gap that has not changed uh, dramatically over the years, and in fact has gotten a little bit worse. As you can see, the yellow line here is the um, homeownership rate for Black households, and particularly since 2000, and I think this is a phenomenon that um, you know some national research has focused focused on, is that not only has that not um, has that not recovered since the financial crisis, but has really lost lost some ground, even as homeownership rates have um, have recovered overall and um, and for other groups. The homeownership rate in Delaware is particularly high. Um, so we're usually in like the top five states um, on homeownership rate. I would add for, for this data um, and as annual estimates and we're a pretty small state that can bounce around quite a bit. Um, so that estimate of 77.9, I know that shows a really sharp uh, uptick in the last couple of years. And there's a pretty good margin of error on that. Um, so you know it's within kind of two percentage points in either direction. Um, but as you can see, we're about 10 percentage points higher than the, um, than the country as a whole. And we see that when we look at homeownership for different groups as well. You know, this chart for um, this just for Delaware is very similar to the previous one um, for the country as a whole, just kind of pushed up, um, pushed up around, around 10 percentage points for all groups. But that gap uh, is still the same. It's around 30, um, uh, around 30 uh, points between homeownership for white households and black households. So how we approach this um, is a both and, I think. And you know, I think this is the message we get from best practices in fair housing and affirmatively furthering fair housing is to be doing both and. So we want to be you know, reinvesting in, uh, in neighborhoods that have you know, suffered from you know, historic patterns of segregation and redlining and, um, and disinvestment um, and you know, be investing in community driven redevelopment, supporting healthy market activity there. Um, but we also want to be making sure that there is choice and access that folks can access credit, that there are affordable homeownership uh, opportunities in all areas. Um, so in new development as well um, and other home buyer supports. So we wanna be doing, we wanna be doing both. And I think um, the programs that I'll talk a little bit about that DSHA has are kind of on, on both sides of that. 
So our flagship program is the Home Ownership Loan Program. Uh, it offers mortgages and down payment assistance for first time and repeat home buyers um, through a network of partner lenders. I think there are about 40. Um, there also are a few other kind of special products in there. So um, through the different um, kind of authorities that we have and accessing different financing, uh, we can offer different special products at times. Um, so for example, the 203K product um, can help folks who are want to buy a home that needs a lot of, of repair, for example, and it has some special uh, special procedures and things in there to help, um, help make those repairs at the time of purchase. We also offer a first time home buyer tax credit. Um, this particular program is limited just to first time home buyers, but it is an excellent deal. Uh, it can offer a refundable tax credit of up to $2,000 a year for the life of the loan uh, for folks who are first time buyers and who meet the household income requirements. Um, those are a little bit lower for that program than for our programs as a whole. Um, overall, last year um, we helped over 2,000 uh, Delaware families purchase a home and over 480 million in mortgage loans. So we are a pretty significant chunk of the, of the mortgage market in Delaware. Uh, it varies year by year, um, but typically our HLP program makes up about 10 to 15% of the first mortgage purchase loans that are originated in the state. And there's a screenshot here of our primary website for, um, for our home ownership programs, Kiss Your Landlord Goodbye. Um, it includes a lot of resources. Um, about homeowners, how we can help, um, but also connections to housing counselors, lenders, and other information as well. So on the, the other side of that, the both and is um, investing in homeownership opportunities um, and particularly in community oriented uh, redevelopment, homeownership development. So the primary resources we have here are the Housing Development Fund, the Strong Neighborhoods Housing Fund, um, and although it's not its primary purpose is not for home ownership. The DDD program um, is also a resource um, for, for development. So the Housing Development Fund is the State Housing Trust Fund, um, and we make that funding available. It can support home ownership development. That's new construction. Um, on the left is a picture uh, in Ellendale, a Sussex County Habitat for Humanity project um, in the Ingram Village development. So new construction and a new development. Um, on the right um, is an example of some homes that will be undergoing redevelopment in Claymont, so more kind of community development oriented homeownership projects. There have been a variety of those throughout the, throughout the state, many in Wilmington and also in you know, other towns. Uh, Seaford comes to mind, and there are a few others. Oh, there's another one from Seaford, <laughs> another Sussex County Habitat for Humanity project in Seaford. Um, so it can really support areas where you know, there's an effort to to increase the homeownership rates, to you know, improve um, improve existing structures. Sometimes um, you know it can support infill after there's been demolition um, or other kind of really um, community development oriented um, homeownership development. And on the HDF, I would add to that um, you know the source of that the um, the purpose of that funding is to help make the home more affordable. Um, so frequently in neighborhoods where the market is very challenged. You know, the home might need $100,000 worth of work for say, you know, um, a home can be purchased for say $50,000, but it needs $100,000 worth of work. Um, so already it's at 150,000, but maybe it only appraises for 120. Um, so our funding can help fill that gap and also help make sure that the home is affordable, um, affordable to a lower income home buyer as well. And so in that sense, um, and in the Strong Neighborhoods Housing Fund as well, part of the purpose of the funding is to help facilitate that healthy market activity, you know, help, um, help get some development going that then is attracting other private investment and development activity. So the Strong Neighborhoods Housing Fund is another um, large source here. It really grew out of response to the foreclosure crisis. There was a federal program called the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. And when that ended, um, around the same time that it was kind of winding down, um, there was um, some settlement funds in the state from some of the mortgage settlements. And this fund was established with that one-time funding, I think in 2015, and has a couple rounds of funding available. And since got moved into the ongoing state budget um, and has really seen excellent support, which we are very, very uh, thankful for, um, to see it become, become permanent and staying in the bond bill. 
um, it's been able to um, support projects up and down the state um, in a lot of different a lot of different neighborhoods. Um, frequently, they are in our um, in our application and priorities for this uh, for this program. We really want to see partnerships. Uh, we want to be uh, you know funding the housing initiatives that are part of intensive community developed, community driven plans particularly. Um, so there's a lot of priority placed on that as well, that it's part of an overall effort. A couple examples of these, um, an excellent one I think is in Dover as part of the restoring central Dover plan. Um, there's been a lot of infill and vacant lots um, as well as demolition of some homes that really uh, were kind of beyond, beyond repair and beyond saving and were uh, challenges and eyesores um, in filling back on those lots as well with a variety of partners. Um, and they're also, I think this is a great example where there's a lot of other um, development activity going on and it's the result of a very community driven and engaged, engaged plan. Another is Laurel. Um, and here, I think, I think these are both Sussex County Habitat for Humanity <laughs> um, projects again, but uh, in some of the smaller towns, um, strong neighborhoods has been able particularly to address um, blighted properties. Um, the overall goal is to address vacant abandoned properties um, you know, as part of overall community development plans. Uh, it's quite a few projects in Wilmington. Um, this example is the 30th Street project. Um, I think there are some, I think it's a little more progressed now, but these were the most recent pictures I, I had on hand, but quite a few projects in Wilmington as well. Um, and this one in Edgemore, I love the before and after here, I think is excellent. It just shows what a difference, um, what a difference that investment can make and what a difference that makes in the community. You know, I think this was a corner property um, and you can see its condition and the transition, um, the transition to home ownership and improvement on the property is such a difference. A few more here in the Route 9 corridor. I think this, this is another excellent example um, of you know, strong neighborhoods housing fund investment um, being paired with you know, many, other, many other resources. Um, it was also paired with strategic um, home repair um, efforts um, led, by, led by Newcastle County. The work in all of the neighborhoods here has really been, really been fantastic. And I think really see the impact of that uh, over the years in those areas. So the downtown development district program, it is not a home ownership focused program, but I think um, from the development side, and I know I'm officially on home buyer supports, but a little sprinkling uh, on development leading into the next speakers. Um, it can be used uh, for home ownership development and has been. Um, the DDD program uh, was established in 2015 and communities uh, put together a plan, apply to be designated at certain times when the applications are open. Um, those plans are reviewed by the Office of State Planning Coordination um, and the Cabinet Council on State Planning Issues and ultimately are designated by the governor. As part of that plan, you know, a community is designating a specific area, very, very specific, um, and setting out a plan for that area, usually centered around the Central Business District um, and some, uh, some surrounding residential. And part of that includes, you know, what will the what will the city or the town's investment in those areas be? So there's a layer of incentives kind of from, from local government all the way up to state government. Um, and the biggest incentive there really is the downtown development district rebate program. So the rebate program can provide a rebate for investments in real property in those designated dis districts. And that can be any number of, of types of projects. I think we've seen uh, a huge range. It can be very large projects. It can be residential projects. Um, that can be um, commercial, it can also be uh, like tenant fit outs. Um, so if there's a restaurant moving into a building, they don't own the building, uh, but they need to make some investments to fit out the, um, to fit out the, the site for the restaurant, that can also count uh, as long as it's you know, meeting the, the program guidelines. As a whole, there have been about 217 projects in 12 of the districts so far, and about 36 million in state investment to date. And so the reason I added it here is because particularly in some of the smaller towns where the districts include more surrounding residential area, um, it's been able to um, be used for home ownership development as well. Um, both nonprofit and for-profits um, have been able to use it. Um, here are a few pictures just from some of the towns 
Um, there's been new construction um, and also acquisition and rehab. Um, some of the Strong Neighborhoods Housing Fund uh, investments um, are also coordinated with the DDD, like in Dover, for example, the DDD plan and the Restoring Central Dover plan um, that the um, Strong Neighborhoods Housing Fund supports are very, very closely linked and inform each other. I love this one on the on the bottom right. Um, it shows what was in that space before and the after after that structure was um, was demolished and some new townhomes added. Got some festive Christmas decorations here. And here are a few others uh, in both Wilmington, Delaware City, and Harrington. Um, Harrington particularly has uh, seen quite a bit of use of the DVD program for um, for home ownership projects too. And there's my contact info, um, and you know, happy to. I'll defer to you, Senator Lachman, on, on questions or anything else. Sorry. Sure. No, we'll always make a couple couple of minutes um, for questions and see if anybody has any. And I'll just use this moment before we go into our last set of presentations um, that you know we're going to make sure all members of the subcommittee have have uh, copies of these presentations. Um, so you're not going to be expected, I don't think, today uh, to, to affirm 100% which priorities you support. We wanted to make sure everyone had that information. Um, so you'll have a little homework to sort of review and, um, you know, vote essentially on, on the items that you think should be part of our, our uh, priorities, I think, is, is what we're, we're discussing as a path forward. But I just want to make sure everybody gets the education today. So any questions for, for Marlena? Let me see. Representative Lambert. I want to thank everyone for their presentations today. I did want to thank Marlena for your support with the two fish home rehabilitations in Claymont. It was particular, <clears throat> particularly effective in an area that is historically dealt with redlining for low income and communities of color. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. So we have one component left to talk about. If, if you have not had your head filled enough this morning, we're gonna move into housing development. We have two speakers. Um, one is Jerry Heisler with the Rivald Group and one is Katie Millard with Sussex County for Habitat for Humanity. So Mr. Heisler, I see you're off mute. Um, so we're gonna give you your time and then, uh, and then Katie will come to you to, to wrap us up and give us the, the Sussex County perspective. Um, that we often, uh, we sometimes neglect. Uh, so go ahead, Jerry, the floor is yours. Good morning, Senators, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. It's been quite a privilege. We're gonna share our document in a second. Uh, there you go. Tell me if you can see it. I, I think we see it. There we go. Showing up. Showing up. Can you see it? You can see it. Great. Good morning. First, I'd like to thank Marlena and her team. Um, there was mentions of evictions before during COVID. Uh, as a landlord, I'm with the Rayville Group and we manage manufactured housing as well as rental townhomes, apartments, and single families, predominantly in the Bear Area and Middletown, as well as in Wilmington. And uh, what we found interesting, the rental assistance program has had a dramatic and material impact on having a lifeline for renters, um, especially in the mobile home area, I would say the majority of the people that were COVID impacted are going to be saved and not have impacts. And a uh, fair number of the ones in our rental units that are non-manufactured housing will as well, but there's also a group of people that are just ignoring it. I don't know why, but they are. So I'd like to thank Marlene and her team. They've done a wonderful job. Um, the first slide we have is the paradigm. Um, and that is for every decision, there's a short and long-term cost and benefit. Our policymakers only interested in the short-term, long-term or both. Uh, that's something I've been dealing with with manufactured housing for years and also in Newcastle County with just development for years. This is a problem uh, and it's something you have to wrestle with because it affects racial, ethnic and religious um, issues dealing with housing. Um, we don't think of it, but uh, there are various religions that are moving to Delaware. Um, and as a result, they want their door facing a certain direction uh, to the east. And as a result, they can't find housing in certain developments. So housing today is 
taking on an international flavor, even in Delaware. And it's important, our orientation of housing and what we think orientation for solar reasons. So housing is becoming a more complicated uh, process in how we design and use it. Next slide, please. I'm actually going back to getting a master's in uh, international migration or immigration right now. And last night I happened to run across a comment and it's creating healthy communities, promoting diversity, inclusion, building a vibrant democracy, advancing equity and equality for all people. This is about nonprofits and their impact on immigrants and refugees. Oddly enough, I thought this is an appropriate comment for today and what the strategies ought to be for housing. You know, we want to create healthy communities, vibrant democracies, advancing equity and equality for all people. In trying to figure this out, what to say today, I thought of basic economics, demand and supply. So the supply of housing that is not affordable is out there. The housing for affordable housing or low income housing or income challenged housing is not out there. And it hasn't been out there for decades in Newcastle County. Um, and it's a real problem and it's getting significantly worse for a lot of reasons. First of all, there's a preference just for rental housing today, but it's hard to, at least in Newcastle County and other parts of the state, to find appropriate parcels for rental housing. There's also a question, I'm not always in the agreement, I have both of, um, we sell housing as well, uh, providing ownership and housing. A lot of economically challenged people cannot afford housing and afford the maintenance with housing to replace a heater. In our mobile home parks, I'm willing to bet over 50% of the people that have air conditioning condensing coils, they don't operate. They can't afford to fix them. They don't have air conditioning. And this includes seniors where air conditioning is really critical. Um, there's various types of housing, apartments, single family, townhomes, twins, and HUD. HUD is manufactured housing. We haven't had a new manufactured housing community in the state of Delaware probably in 30 years. We did the last one in Newcastle County about 35 years ago. There's a need for all these types of housing, but there are problems in getting uh, that housing in place, and I'll discuss it in a minute. Financing standards are tight and they've tightened up significantly and they'll continue to tighten because the federal government is requiring underwriters to have of those standards for selling homes to provide, um, I would say more details as well as more responsibility in the lending practices as a result, they go to higher credit standards as well as other underwriting criteria and the net result is it cuts a lot of people out of buying housing that should be able to get housing. Uh, if you have a bad medical record, payment record, that may impact your credit standing. And as a result, you can't get housing. And that's just not right. Uh, families and individuals that are economically challenged less lack ec certain economic support, supplemental supports. And that's really critical. I'll discuss that in a minute as well. Next slide, please. The supply of housing is one of the biggest problems we face, especially for the affordable component. In Newcastle County, running a plan through the Uniform Development Code is a brain damaging experience. I wouldn't recommend it. It's also expensive. And now as a result of years and years of less and less developers participating in the process and plans going through, we're starting to see a significant shortage even at the middle range pricing level and upper range pricing level for lots. Uh, the record planning process is cumbering. It's not for people who do not have experience. There are no small developers anymore and there are very few middle-sized developers. They're usually national firms. Since 2008, banks are no longer funding development subdivisions, which is a big problem. Uh, without that capital being extended to development, who's going to finance it. As if any of you have been reading, materials are very expensive now. Lumber has gone up from four to $500, a thousand board feet, all the way up to $1,200, $1,300 for a thousand board feet. And that result is housing is going to get almost unbelievably impossible to uh, price out. A mobile home, we were buying for a little, 
around $35,000 at cost last year. It's now $50,000 at cost, that much of an increase in six months. The inventory of housing is low. In affordable housing below $300,000, it's almost non-existent. And if it does exist, it's in terrible condition. There's no incentives for affordable housing for the most part to build it, or very few. The net result is none's being built. Incentives, I mean density. Yeah, I have low density and government mandates in the next line. We in Newcastle County do not have high density housing. You don't have high density housing, you're not gonna have affordable housing unless somebody subsidizes it. Additionally, they're increasing standards, environmental standards, building standards. I expect very shortly in the next couple of years to have sprinkler requirements, not a bad thing, actually a good thing, but it adds cost. All these costs add and burden the ability for it, someone who is economically challenged to get into a house or a rental unit as well at a lower cost. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. The government response, by the way, maybe not at the state level so much, but at the local level is we, and definitely at the uh, federal level, they tighten financial standards at the local level, they tighten development standards. We have more requirement for underwriting of potential purchasers and developers. This does not paint a pretty picture. And we're all responsible for this. It's not one group of people, all of us are. Next. So one of the things I wanna talk about real quickly, and I'm glad, um, I'm, I'm glad uh, Ms. Miller brought it up, was uh, the idea of uh, code violations and being evicted. I was involved in a manufactured home community. I didn't own it. I was advising uh, a state, two state representatives and the county on it. In Claymont, there was a 20 unit mobile home park and 10 units were being used in a very uh, illegal fashion and 10 other units were there. And they thought about closing the park down. And I went to them and said, don't do that because all that's gonna happen is you're gonna create at least 10 additional people who are gonna be homeless. So the question is, how do we help people that are in substandard housing? Now, substandard housing goes beyond, beyond HUD units, but there's a great number of people who are in substandard housing. If we evict them, they are homeless. That is, to me is not the right ethical or moral decision. We have to come up with a program in the state of Delaware that grants people dollars for their substandard housing to repair it and to give them a second chance. A lot of these people are uh, don't have the confidence to ask for these help. this help. A lot of these individuals don't know how to ask for it. And you'll see in a slide later, we have to communicate with people. And that's really an important aspect to housing communication. Next slide, please. I have some solutions, you're not gonna agree. Penrose Hollins, the councilman from Newcastle County and I don't agree on some of these uh, solutions. I believe there should be grant or vouchers beyond section eight that are greater than section eight amounts issued by the state. The reason I believe that is that gives people choice. They can go with the market rate housing. I think that's important because even if, and I'll skip down a minute, even if you go into mandated housing, inclusionary housing, it's not gonna build enough units to create the critical mass you need for affordable housing. And that's really critical, that critical mass. We need to have less restrictions on the land use fund. If we don't, we're gonna get into trouble. We have to incentivize affordable housing through financial incentives, through density incentives. Mandating it is not gonna make it happen. You can mandate it now all you want. There's just not enough land above the canal in Newcastle County to build it, east of one down in Sussex to build it. We have to come up with ways, a mixture of ways to do it. If you look at the academic literature on inclusionary housing, it's worked in some areas of the county, not in others. I'm not convinced it'll work throughout the state. And I think it's one item to do, but it, we just don't have enough capacity being built to include it. Grant economic challenged homeowners repair grants for their homes so they can stay in them. And it should be in a positive way, not a, it should be in a welcoming, welcoming way, not an unwelcoming way. Another challenge which we're gonna be facing, especially with affordable housing is sustainable housing 
I'm talking about with the environment. Uh, one of the things I learned about 10 years ago, if you look at housing itself, that's being built today as an environmental liability, it's gonna remain an environmental liability for the next 80 years. So we need to go in and help individuals who are in affordable housing to get them to get solar insulation, to have better water usage in their home and so on. One of the most important things is communication. And I wanna discuss this in twofold. The first is just helping people out. I was involved in getting uh, someone involved in the food subsidy programs, either through the food bank or other means. Also the Part D forms for Medicaid, Medicare, pardon me. Getting people to fill that out leaves them more money for other things. Most people in our manufactured housing communities don't know about filling out Part D. This is a problem. Um, evictions, having sustained rental assistance program for seniors are really, really important. And I think there has to be more dialogue on that sooner than later. Obviously, it can really help out. Uh, next question. Uh, be careful of quick fixes. There's always a run to partial or total rent control. It doesn't fix anything. If you look at New York, their affordable housing has gotten worse. Another important concept to think out, if you want a partnership with private capital, if you treat it poorly, it'll leave Delaware. Finally, the bottom line, a lot of this is about money. And we have to find different ways of that to get money. You know, there's talk about reducing the transfer fee for the sale of housing. I would like to see part of that money, even a quarter percent of that, for the buyer and seller to go into a trust fund in the state that would be managed by Marlena and her team. It would be really, really helpful. Um, thank you for your time. I don't know if I've been of help, but. Uh, I really appreciate speaking in front of you. Thank you, Jerry. I really appreciate you uh, sort of representing the supply side and the landlord perspective. I think it's valuable. It's an important part of the, the ecosystem of housing. And uh, and I, I can speak for myself for sure that I really appreciate you sharing that perspective with us. Um, just a couple of, uh, I'll give it a couple quick minutes if anyone has a pressing question before we go on to our final presentation. Um, before discussing some, some additional recommendation options. Um, anyone have any burning questions for Mr. Heisler? All right, I don't see any yet. Again, I really, really appreciate that. I think it helps sort of round out, out, the, out the picture there. Um, housing providers are, are certainly part of getting to housing. Um, and, and on that note, um, we have uh, we have Katie Millard with the Sussex County Habitat for Humanity uh, to talk a little bit about um, affordable housing in that part of our state. Uh, got to see, see Katie make a presentation um, a couple of months ago and was really impressed and, and knew that would be something this committee would, would be interested in hearing. So Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Senator. And I'm also going to share my screen. Um, hold on. Hmm. I know. I don't know why, but it won't let me share my PowerPoint. So hold on. Okay. Right here. Maybe. Maybe I'll just share my regular screen and hopefully it'll come up. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Oh, we can see it. See it. Perfect. Okay. Workarounds. <laughs> Okay, um, so thank you so much for having me. My name is Katie Millard. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Development at Sussex County Habitat for Humanity. Um, and today I'm gonna talk a little bit about Sussex County housing statistics. Um, and before I get into the housing statistics, I am going to talk a little bit about some background information. So what is affordable housing exactly? 
um, why is it important? And I know a lot of people before me, um, my wonderful colleagues have already spoken a little bit about that. So I'll go past that pretty quickly. Um, and then a little bit uh, again about housing statistics and then why it is the way it is. And Jerry spoke about that and we've been seeing a lot of the same problems as they have, especially um, now in the middle of COVID. Um, so some of that might be a little bit of a repeat, but um, I'll go through that pretty quickly as well. So um, also just keep in mind, a lot of these statistics are blanket statistics. Um, unfortunately, a lot of there's there's a lack of studies and resources, especially for Sussex County, that talk about inequality outside of the analysis of impediments. Um, so a lot of these statistics are just general housing affordability statistics. But we do know that BIPOC residents are more likely to negative, be, negatively be affected by high housing costs um, and also systemic patterns of segregation and most recently by COVID-19. So if we just look at wage, um, Black households in Sussex County have a median household income of $24,000 less than white households. So that's 42,000 versus about 66,000. And additionally, um, people of color are more likely to live in communities with poverty rates above 20%. And these disparities actually continue statewide. So if we look at Wilmington, Black and Hispanic households have a median income of approximately $30,000. And that's half of the median income for white families. And the home ownership gap is also large, and that leads to a wealth gap, and that's fueled by lower home ownership rates. Um, so why is that? It's lack of access to affordable housing. And what is affordable housing? I know that term gets thrown around a lot. Um, affordable housing simply means that you pay less than 30% of your income towards your housing costs. And that could be, um, if you're a renter, that means your rent. And if you're a homeowner, that means your mortgage payment, including your taxes and insurance and your HOA fees and your lot fees, if those are applicable. And affordability can be based on market costs. So simply if you're able to afford what the market is asking for your home, or it could be because of subsidy. So that subsidy could be government subsidy, grant subsidy, um, donations in the form of habitat, um, different types of type of subsidies that will lower your housing costs to make sure that you're able to afford that home. Um, unfortunately, in Delaware, one in seven households spends half or more of their income on housing. So if you think about that, that's a lot of money towards your housing costs, right? So can you pay for everything else you need to pay for after you pay your rent or your mortgage costs? Um, and there are consequences to that. So if we, and this is using the minimum wage in Delaware. So if you are a single mother who earns minimum wage and spends half or more of her income on rent, you only have $160 per week after tax or $23 a day to spend on all other necessities. And that includes utilities. So the rent does not include utility payments. Um, so there's not a lot of wiggle room in there. Additionally, half of cost burden renters had less than $10 in savings in 2015. Um, and that was before COVID-19. So COVID-19 has only exasperated these issues that we are seeing with affordability. And something that Jerry also mentioned, which I think is also really important, is housing is important because it affects so many different parts of life. So if you have access to safe, decent, and affordable housing, it creates stronger families, greater economic opportunities, um, stronger communities, more equitable communities, and also it it contributes to the local economy. You're better, better able to retain workers. Um, people have shorter commutes, so that means less traffic. And it also means more diverse businesses and sustainable growth within different communities. So to get down to Sussex County, um, about two years ago, County Council contracted out to an affordable housing contractor to see what what it looked like in Sussex County with housing. Um, this was called the home study. And what they did was they evaluated housing needs to see what the issues were, what was lacking and um, make a few different recommendations on how to fix those things. So um, what they found and which was not a surprise is that there was not enough affordable housing. And 
this slide is really interesting because it shows the top industries in Sussex County. And this is also 2019. So remember, um, this is also pre-COVID. Um, these top industries, their average wage, the affordable rent level for these industries, and the affordable home ownership level for these industries. And the one thing I do want to point out for the affordable home ownership level is that it's taking into account that two people in that household are working. So if it's only a single head of household, um, you would not be able to afford these home ownership levels. Um, and unfortunately, with the home ownership levels, the home study found that in May 2019, 80% of homes for sale were single family homes, and only 13% of homes listed were under $200,000. But a third of jobs in Sussex County pay wages that can afford, afford homes much less than $20,000. I took a look at Zillow yesterday just to, to see what was out there right now. And out of 1,288 total listings on Zillow, less than 150 were listed at $200,000. And if you think about it, to afford a $200,000 home, you have to make about $47,000 a year. So a lot of industries do not pay that amount of money. Um, and the also according to Zillow, the uh, average home value right now in Sussex County for sale is about three hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars, and that number is up about nine point three percent over the past year alone. So I know Dr. Saunders asked a little bit about what inventory was currently out there for home ownership, and the inventory is very low. Uh, a lot of times when we talk to community members, they say they are pre-approved for mortgages. Um, they're, they're looking for a house, but they just cannot find a home that is affordable to them. So uh, there is a big problem with supply and offering affordable home ownership opportunities to people who really want to be homeowners. Um, and then if we think about this larger context of unaffordability, there are different realities that people experience when it comes to housing. So households of color face higher cost burdens. Um, an estimated 62% of Hispanic renters in Sussex County and 42% of black renters are cost burdened. And that's compared to 37% for white renters and 38% of all other races. Um, additionally, Hispanic and black households are more likely than white households to be renters, um, which also means that they are cost burdened and that looks like white households have about an 84% um, home ownership rate. Only less than half of Hispanic homeowners, so 48.7%, and 59% of Black households are homeowners. And one especially impactful statistic that I just wanted to bring up from the analysis of impediments is that um, in Sussex County, 61.5% of white home loan applications were approved from 2014 to 2017, while only 38% of black applicants were approved within the same time period. So we're also seeing a big difference in access to credit for who is able to get, get homes. Um, and also it's often suggested that people just move west to go get affordable housing. And this is a housing and transportation cost burden visual. So, if we look at this slide here, um, the, the visual on the left shows cost burden alone. So the lighter colors show less cost burden. The visual on the right is a heat map of cost burden of housing plus transportation costs. So in Sussex County, uh, on average, Sussex Countyans pay about 56% of their income towards their housing costs and transportation costs. And that's because to get more affordable housing, people have to move further away from their jobs and from job centers and areas of opportunity. So they're paying more money to get to their positions while paying slightly less for housing costs, but even then people are still paying too much for their housing. Um, and then one last statistic that, that I want to include in here is that by 2050, we're going to need about 7,000 units for people who make less than 80% of area median income. And this is Sussex County, so this is not statewide. Um, and a little bit of context on that, Sussex County Habitat is probably one of the largest um, producers of affordable housing in Sussex County, and we build between 10 and 12 units a year. 
So um, if you think about that, we are way behind what we need to build. So there just needs to be more incentive, more ways to get more people to build affordable units in Sussex County. Um, and that includes rentals. So I know we're known for affordable housing home ownership, but there's, um, there needs to be a lot more production of just affordable housing in general. So um, for extremely low income households, so that those households or make those households who make 30% or less of area median income, there are about 38 affordable rentals for every 100 families across the state. And this disproportionately affect, affects Black households because according to the analysis of impediments, almost 70% of households in affordable rental apartments are Black. So um, it is really important that we offer housing opportunities across all income levels, across the whole housing spectrum. So that includes rental units, shelters for individuals and families experiencing homelessness, supportive units, um, housing options for recently incarcerated individuals. And I know Cheyenne talked a little bit about that in her presentation. Um, other options, including accessory dwellings. And another thing that people have said in, in this meeting today, which I think is really important, is we also need to offer opportunities to current homeowners who currently live in their homes, but are having trouble keeping up their property. Um, we actually just launched a new neighborhood revitalization program this past year, and the need for home repairs is staggering. We, we have seen so many people come to us and they need help for such, such small things that could actually make them lose their home. Like if you need to replace a window because people can come in, because uh, the window is just entirely broken. Um, people are not able to afford to replace that window and that could lead to so many other problems. So in conclusion, um, I think there are many reasons why um, we have a lot of these issues. And in Sussex County, um, just a few are the cost to build exceeds what is affordable to many low-income families, especially along the coast, because to buy land is very, very expensive. Um, also, zoning laws prohibit us to build higher density in um, really across Sussex County in general. So to find land to build higher density is really difficult and um, with higher density comes a more affordable product that we are able to offer. Um, and there are many other issues out there um, that I'm not really gonna go through because I feel like we can probably talk about this for days and not get through everything. But um, if anybody has any questions about this, uh, here's my contact information. Um, and then one final thing I just wanna leave you on is that with investment in housing, comes so much more investment in the community. So just for Habitat, every dollar that's invested in Sussex County Habitat, $1.66 is actually injected back into the economy. And that's through tax increases, um, not tax increases, but increases on the tax roll, um, support of local economy, support of local businesses. So really investing in housing is probably one of the best investments that we can make in, in Sussex County and in Delaware in general. So thank you. Thank you, Katie. It's fantastic. Uh, round of applause for you. Round of applause for everyone who has made a presentation um, this morning. I, I do feel like we did just do, I think, as Marlena said, like a, a mini conference on <laughs> housing from A to Z and really appreciate everyone helping us to kind of um, set the context, put that all in, in front of us um, as to the scope of, of the problems that we're seeing that we would like to address. Um, so that we can consider what recommendations we as a subcommittee would like to, to elevate. So thank you all. Um, I will pause for a moment to see if anyone has any questions for Katie, um, or at this point, I think all of our presenters are still here. Maybe if you have questions for anyone, um, we can take a couple minutes to do that before we look at a couple more slides um, and then move on to public comment. But uh, let's see, don't see any. Any questions? Okay, good. All right. Well, hold hold your your thoughts. Hopefully, you're taking notes and digesting um, all of this great information that we've had. Um, the next thing that I would like to touch on briefly, um, if we can go to the next slide, is we we did um, look at one specific source for some additional potential recommendations for us to consider that we wanted to bring 
um, before you. Um, again, we're not gonna vote officially to approve these today, but just wanted to give you some food for thought. Um, and then we will send out, you know, sort of a homework survey on these items and then some other items pulled from, from potentially pulled from some of the other presentations that you've heard um, and anything else that you'd like to contribute. So um, in 2020, um, there was a statewide analysis of impediments to fair housing choice, which we heard sort of as a recurring theme um, come up. Um, I think Mr. Heisler in particular talked about choice for, for tenants. And uh, so we wanted to highlight a handful of those that we think that we would like to elevate um, just to get your, your feedback or just your thoughts glowing. So I'm gonna to touch on a couple of them and the last two, Caitlin will help me um, dive a little deeper into, but we can go to the next slide. Um, so that we, we highlighted two of the major goals um, that this report highlighted. Um, one, you know, obviously being very aligned with our goals as a subcommittee um, of the African American Task Force, uh, being the prevention of displacement of, uh, you know, our black and brown low to moderate income residents. Um, and they had a couple of specific recommendations around that, as you can see here, I'll just read them briefly or paraphrase them. Um, so looking at uh, how can we improve protections for uh, manufactured homeowners in, in those types of communities, um, including support to, to facilitating um, conversion to cooperative ownership. Um, and another recommendation that the group that issued the report um, uh, put out there was for um, changes to the Delaware Code to permit tenants to appeal um, decisions from JP court to the Superior Court um, and from there to other appellate courts in their um, landlord tenant uh, litigation or eviction cases and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so those were two items um, that we thought we would uh, potentially include in our recommendations moving forward. Uh, does anybody have any any questions? I'm not, I don't necessarily have area uh, you know expertise on, on these specifically, but we discussed them, uh, Senator Pinky and I discussed them and um, identified them as, as areas to to look further into. So if anyone has any comments or expertise um, or questions, feel free to offer those now. Um, if not, we will move on to the next set of recommendations we pulled from that report. Okay. Um, so then again, so ensuring equal access to housing. Again, we have our particular focus on folks from protected classes, uh, certainly folks with from lower income brackets and those experiencing homelessness. Um, and a few of the items from that report that we wanted to highlight were to advocate for the removal or banning um, of some of these crime-free housing and nuisance ordinances um, that we have seen that have um, you know, provided a basis for, for displacement or you know, lack of access to begin with. Um, and then um, uh, these last two, Caitlin, if you wanna, did you wanna speak to them a little bit more specifically? I think you said these last two were ones you had some. Sure. Um, hi everybody, I'm Caitlin Dalcalo. I'm a policy analyst for the Senate Majority Caucus. And I recently attended a national low-income housing coalition call um, in which they cited a new study on tenant screening and selection criteria. Um, this study was done in the Twin Cities metro area in um, Minnesota. And um, the report touched on you know, the four general criteria that um, are used to, to select tenants. So that's income level, rental history, credit history, and criminal history. And so this report actually cites a, a different study that was also done in Minnesota. Um, that report is called Success in Housing, How Much Does Criminal Background Matter? And what this study found is that, I'm sorry, I'm just scrolling to the right page here. So of the 15 categories of criminal offenses that this study looked at, 11 categories showed no evidence of having a significant link to negative housing outcomes. Um, 
They also found that criminal offenses that occurred more than five years prior to a tenant moving in have no significant effect on housing outcomes. And that's true of um, felony offenses. So um, the idea here is that, you know, if a landlord is looking at a record that goes beyond that five-year window, you know, that could be unfairly disadvantaging the tenant. Um, and so HUD has published guidance on how to um, abide by the Fair Housing Act when it comes to using criminal records in your, your tenant screening selection. So I'd be happy to share with the subcommittee the HUD guidance as well as the success in housing um, report for everybody's review. And then um, regarding credit history, this, this first report on tenant screening and selection um, made the point that you know, FICO scores are not necessarily indicative of somebody's you know, success in housing. So I'd like to read just a couple of excerpts um, from this study, if I can find the right quote. Um, so it says, a number of studies have raised concerns about and identified issues with FICO and other credit scoring systems. For example, households of color tend to produce consistently lower scores under these reporting systems, and certain groups seem to be particularly disadvantaged, including those who have made little use of traditional financial credit products. Further, credit scoring derives from a long national history of housing discrimination and the resulting dual credit market. Many factors used in determining credit scores do not assess the risk of the borrower as much as they assess the riskiness of the environment in which the consumer is seeking credit or the riskiness of the type of financial products the consumer uses. Um, and then another excerpt I'd like to share is, uh, contrary to what credit scores purportedly show, there is good reason to believe many tenant applicants with low credit scores will rely be, reliably pay rent. Many tenants facing medical bills or consumer bills defer payment on these bills in order to pay their rent. As the common maxim goes, this is because the rent eats first. And uh, several small studies confirm this practice. So um, I just wanted to you know, share that information with you and, you know, offer it up for consideration um, for the subcommittee. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, great job in bringing those to us. And so, again, I know that we have thrown a lot at you and, um, and we all know that from our, our prior survey of, of where we all stand that we are, you know, committed to making sure that folks have high quality, sustainable, uh, housing opportunities across the, you know, the span of going from the experience of homelessness to renting to, to home ownership um, and, and making sure that, that we are providing those opportunities to them uh, from the supply side and removing barriers um, on the uh, demand side. So, um, hold on, I think I see a hand here. Oh, okay. Uh, Dr. Saunders, you have a question? Oh, don't forget to unmute. I just wanted to say that the information Caitlin provided, I mean, is so, so important. And it really shows uh, how realtors, for example, really need to look beyond the numbers. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and my other question is, is how this information, you know, is available uh, to realtors. Uh, who have to review, uh, you know, applications for, uh, you know, to, you know, you know, to rent, uh, because I know I'm a landlord, and I have to pinch myself sometimes so that I look beyond the numbers, and try to dig deeper into the person as a way of considering whether or not the person will be, you know, a reliable, a reliable tenant. And thankfully, in, in some situations, you know, I have said, well, I'm going to give this person an opportunity, and they ended up being an exemplary, um, an exemplary tenant. Thank you.
Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, sorry. My computer. I think Senator Lachman is having some technical difficulties. I, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. My, I don't know why my computer just logged out and just kicked me off, but I'm back. Um, sorry if you cannot see me, but all right. Um, great. Sorry about that. I'm a little thrown off from my technical difficulties, but did we have any other questions or comments on the content today? Jerome's hand is up. Okay, well, we'll go to him in, in public comment in just a moment. I just want to make sure we wrap up and then um, and know what's coming next. Okay, so if there aren't any questions, again, I'll, as I said before, um, we are going to compile sort of like a, a survey format, I think, of, of some of the items that we elevated today and drawn from the presentations that you've heard. So we as a subcommittee can all, you know, sort of register what we support or don't support in terms of what we'd ultimately like to present to the full task force as recommendations on housing. Um, and so you be on the lookout for that. That will be your homework you'll be expected to do before we meet again. Um, and then we will affirm that with a vote uh, at, a, at the, our subsequent meeting. So just so you know what to expect, you'll receive the materials from today um, and a document outlining what we propose that we send to the full task force. Any questions about that? Okay. So I think we can go, oh, no, you're good. All right, so I think that is uh, it for the presentations. We can go on to public comment. I know we have a couple of, of folks. Um, and Dr. Saunders, I know you wanted to make an announcement as well. We'll do that after public comment. Is that okay? Thank okay. you. All right. And so let's see here. Let me make sure I can see. Caitlin, would, could you help me with calling on our public commenters? Yes. Um, um, yeah. And so I, for much of the meeting, Donald Farrell had his hand yes. raised, but he just lowered it. So I just wanted oh. to um, give him an opportunity to raise his hand again. Yes. Okay, there it is. Um, so we'll go to Donald first because he's been waiting for a long time <laughs> to give his comments. And then after that, we'll go to Dominique Scott and Kathleen Rutherford. And if you could all just limit your comments to about two minutes, that would be great. Um, Donald, you should be able to speak now. Okay, uh, thank you. I didn't know my hand was raised the whole time. Uh, uh, my name is Donald Farrell and I'm a landlord and tenant rights advocate, uh, as well as a member of the Homes Campaign. Uh, four years ago, I created Ask the Landlord, which is a tenant literacy and eviction prevention project that focuses on tenant rights and responsibilities. Tenant and landlord rights are not mutually exclusive. One cannot exist without the other. Uh, by working with Classy and Legal Services Corporation of Delaware, we held workshops with tenants who shared their problems with their landlords. I began to understand the nature of their complaints. Many of the complaints were valid and had merit, but because the tenant waited too long to ask for help, this resulted in a less than favorable outcome and usually the tenant ended up being evicted. The first step to hand to holding irresponsible landlords accountable is to promote and advance tenant rights and to make mandatory uh, right to counsel available to tenants when they go to court. However, uh, today I would like to ask you to consider making a pre-rental inspection walkthrough checklist a part of the lease agreement, similar to the signed declaration that a copy of the landlord tenant code was provided when the lease was signed. This would protect both parties. The tenant would have a record of the property condition and any deficiencies before moving in and after moving out. Buyer beware. Also, the landlords would benefit because they'd have documented proof of the condition of the property at the beginning of the tenancy and also at the end. 
It would also protect landlords, especially smaller and experienced ones against professional tenants who weaponize licenses and inspections um, if their backs are up against the wall. Everything revolves around housing. By promoting and advancing tenant rights, bad landlords are held accountable, rental housing stock improve, homelessness is reduced, and there are fewer evictions, which means that tenants won't be unfairly evicted and let a problem landlord off the hook to continue to victimize vulnerable tenants. Also, communities and neighborhoods are made stronger and families are more stable and there's less crime. I urge you to please consider changing the landlord tenant code to make a pre-rental inspection walkthrough checklist a part of the rental agreement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. We really appreciate you being here for the whole meeting and, and uh, all of your advocacy and, and your comment. Okay, let's see. Okay, now we move on to Dominique Scott. Um, Dominique, you should be allowed to speak. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Dominique Scott, and I am the Fair Housing Educator and Outreach Coordinator for Pathways to Success, which is located in Georgetown, Delaware. Our mission at Pathways to Success is to work with our communities and raise awareness about housing discrimination and individual rights as it relates to affordable housing in Sussex County. Pathways to Success works with underserved youth and their families in four high schools throughout Sussex County. Many of our, many of our students we work with at some point require housing assistance of some kind. Some examples of that is help with rent, eviction, homelessness after eviction, et cetera. The negative effect of the lack of decent and affordable housing leads to homelessness squatting or couch surfing for many of our families and students we work with. We must help our underserved youth and their families obtain what we all want and many of us have, a decent, affordable place to live and raise our families. Healthy kids oftentimes come from healthy communities and neighborhoods. We need to make, we need to make sure that that is a reality for our underserved communities in Sussex County. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, now we'll move on to Kathleen Rutherford and then after her, we'll have Dustin Thompson. And Kathleen, you should be able to speak. Uh, hey, good afternoon or good morning there, uh, Senator Scott Kidner. I think you just unmuted me. I certainly, if I may, I know Kathleen will not be on the call. She had to go to uh, House Administration so, Senator, if with your uh, opportunity, may I, may I take this chance to say a couple words? Sure, so, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Wonderful. All right. Hey, great. And uh, thanks for this uh, a couple of minutes. So as to the recommendations that will be uh, formed by the group, do you know when um, they will be publicly available? Uh, it sounds like you guys are going to get a, a whole bunch of documents given to you. You're going to review them. And then at the next public meeting, you'll be voting on which recommendations go to the task force. Will there be an opportunity for uh, the landlord community to see those uh, recommendations uh, as they are sent out? Or sort of how, how is the public uh, going to take a look at those? And I guess that was my big question. But I think we will be, as I mentioned before, we'll be voting to affirm a set of recommendations during the next public meeting. Yes, ma'am. And do you know whether those recommendations will be out ahead of time for public um, review before y'all take a, a vote on them? It would be part of the agenda for that meeting, presumably. But that's how we usually do our agendas. Okay, super. All right. Well, very well. Uh, that was sort of, I guess, my big question. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I shall uh, lower my hand. 
Thank you. And sorry, Scott, your name comes up as Kathleen Rutherford. So that's why I said that. Um, that's now, okay. now we'll move on to uh, Dustin Thompson. And then I also see that Cheyenne Miller um, has her hand raised. So we'll, we'll do Dustin first and then Cheyenne. Dustin, you should be able to speak now. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. My name is Dustin Thompson. I work with the Sierra Club Delaware chapter. Uh, a lot of really great information uh, today on the housing issues facing our state and really appreciate uh, the great work that so many people are doing. Um, I, I did want to bring up one point kind of not related to uh, my work at the club, uh, but rather it's just a, a consumer here that has taken, the, taken uh, advantage of the Delaware First Time Home Buyer Program. Um, I, I think one thing, maybe a slight change or, or reconsideration for that program, uh, at least in how we advertise it, but, but possibly how we administer it as well, is the uh, recapture tax on that. Uh, you know, you have to, it, it isn't really put out there very uh, clearly that if you move within nine years of using that program and you've used the, the tax credit, uh, which is up to $2,000 as was stated uh, per year, you could be taxed at 50% of the gain on your house. Uh, and it could be tens of thousands of dollars that you have to pay the state if you move within nine years of uh, purchasing your home through that program. Uh, even if you only got you know, a, a few thousand dollars in tax credit because of your, the way your liability shakes out, uh, it seems from my tax preparer's point of view and, and from my uh, mortgage lender's point of view that it could be well in excess of whatever it is you got out of the program that you end up having to pay the state back uh, if you don't, uh, if you go over a certain income threshold, uh, which is relatively low. Um, so just wanted to point that out because I heard about the program and, and we're facing that issue in my house right now. So I wanted to bring that up. Um, what I'd like to talk about at, at a future meeting perhaps, uh, and I've mentioned this to uh, Senator Lockman, is uh, community solar. I know there was a uh, energy uh, committee hearing on the national level where community solar is brought up and uh, some information got out that wasn't particularly pertinent to the conversations happening in Delaware. Uh, but I'd like to talk about what's happening in Delaware and, and provide some information to this committee since it certainly falls under the purview of environmental and, and infrastructure as well. Uh, so would love to be invited back to talk about that at a, at a future meeting. Uh, if it would uh, please the chairs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm a little bit back here. Okay, do we have any any other folks who would like to make a public comment before we wrap it up? Um, looks like Cheyenne is the only one with a hand raised. Oh, I didn't even see that. Cheyenne? Hi, sorry about that. Um, okay. No, I'm not in the attendees thing, so might have been missed. Um, I was just hoping to um, give public comment, just uh, sort of an addition that doesn't necessarily relate um, in a way that people may think it does, but it definitely does relate. And just talking a little bit about affordability in the state of Delaware um, and and sort of coming back to the idea that like, you know, what is affordable? And we know that if a family's paying more than a third of their income, obviously a home is not affordable. But um, one of the things that contributes to that is the minimum wage. And so when we think about housing, it's very hard to disattach conversations about income, um, obviously, and even harder to disattach conversations about the minimum wage. And so what we like to um, remind people in Delaware is that, um, the, uh, the, the housing wage in Delaware is actually around $22 an hour for you to be able to afford um, a place for you to live. And so it, it's important that we, when we think about raising the minimum wage, and I know we often talk about $15 an hour and we're fighting a very hard fight to get there, we must understand that it is not necessarily a living wage. Um, it is still a minimum wage. A living wage or a housing wage would be $22 an hour. And so when we're talking about housing um, policy, I think it's also important that advocates um, start saying out loud, how much does it really cost to be able to afford a home in Delaware? Um, and, and that should be the number that we all start using, hopefully. Um, as well as saying that, you know, if you're paying more than a third of your income, then that's a problem. So that's all, thank you. 
Thank you as always. All right. Anyone else? We don't have any other hands up at this time. It looks like um, Mr. Heidler is raising his hand to speak. Oh, like physically raising? Yeah, yes. Waving. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was looking for the, the Zoom hand. Okay, sorry. I did it again. Thank Crashed you. again. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I just looked at your new goals and, you know, part of my presentation about cost, talk about costs and benefits. So let me just talk about the FICA score for a minute and that whole business, because we've actually gone to an algorithm approach of different aspects of a person's life. Mm -hmm. We have to figure out how to evaluate someone coming into our community, not in terms of race or ethnicity or religion, but we have to figure that out. And it's also to protect the residents in there. Uh, and we actually, we're involved in trying to figure out the felony aspect and what you, how many years back you go just recently or about three years ago. So when you look at those aspects of your goals, think about how we're going to come up with a way to replace that. We just can't have somebody walk to the front door and say, let me in. Um, it just doesn't work that way. We want to know a little bit about the person and how to do it. So it's, you want to be careful when you take something out because people will be really creative and they'll put something back in there. It'll be a proxy or something else. And then you will get upset about that. So I think it's really important when you look at these goals, that you actually get feedback from the community, the landlord community about how to approach and solve those problems. And not just, I know you're asking about that, but realize that there's benefits, costs and consequences and consequences that may not be observed at the time or anticipated. So you just want to be careful that you don't create a worse situation than we have now. And again, we do not use credit. Our people in our office don't even see someone's credit score. It's part of an overall third party review. And I think it's really important. Um, that isn't the sole criteria and it isn't always a good criteria, but we need some way to understand the individual who's applied. That's really important. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Caitlin, I'm back on my phone, so I'll defer to you if there's any other hands up. Um, I don't see any. I know that um, our member Marlene Saunders wanted to make an announcement about a workshop. Great. Go ahead, Dr. Saunders. Uh, yes. Uh, good morning again. Uh, I just wanted to uh, let everybody know that on May uh, 26, the Delaware Excel Project will be uh, hosting a um, uh, a, a uh, virtual uh, workshop retreat on toxic pollution uh, and the health impacts, and we'll be focusing on air and water pollution uh, in Sussex and uh, Newcastle, Newcastle counties. Uh, one of the things that is unique uh, about this undertaking is that a community, grassroots folk, boots on the ground folk, were uh, involved in advocating uh, for this event uh, and um, uh, planning, uh, planning and implementing it. So the task force is on the in invitation list to receive the, the uh, Save the Date uh, flyer, which will include the link uh, to register. Uh, but what I would ask, uh, and Cassandra and Harold can help me with this because Harold is on the CAC uh, Council uh, and uh, Cassandra is a, a strong advocate and partner with us, is that as you consider registering for the conference, really think about encouraging community members uh, who have an interest in environmental justice and being a part of this. Uh, one of the good things about this event is that the project is learning what community engaged research looks like. You cannot do community engaged research uh, without uh, grassroots folk uh, involved. So look forward uh, to the uh, Save the Date flyer and please, please uh, put it uh, on your, on or in, how do you say that? In your calendars, on your calendars. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think with that, we're ready to close for today. Thank you all for your patience and, and uh, I know you want a couple of minutes over, but I think it was absolutely worth it. We heard a ton of great information, um, some additional ideas and feedback. 
um, afterwards and in the public comment period. And so again, uh, thank you all for, for being part of our process and be on the lookout um, for your email, which will include a review of some items for potential inclusion in our housing-based recommendations for the subcommittee. Um, in our future meetings, we will um, go ahead and, and make that official. And we will also move on um, to the environmental side of our responsibilities as a subcommittee. So uh, Senator Pinckney, I saw you you came back from your committee. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Thank you, Senator Lachman. Yes, Ag Committee was very quick today. Um, <laughs> I want to thank everyone for joining us. You guys gave us some amazing and some sad uh, information and it's helpful and it helps us to figure out where we go next with our work. I would just like to ask if all of the amazing presenters who spoke today could share their PowerPoints with us. That way we can use it to send out to subcommittee members and to start formulating our recommendations. Great, I'm sure we can arrange that. Awesome. All right, everyone. I think we are ready. Um, do we need a Caitlin, do we need a motion to adjourn? Or are we okay? I think we're okay. All right. Well, thank you again, everybody. Um, look out for your email and we will talk to you soon.